Hi, this is Fred from the Apollon project. Today, as promised, I will show you how I built the aluminum fridge magnets you received. I will show you how I built the furnace and the molds and how I poured the metal. The casting process involves the introduction of molten metal into a mold cavity, where upon solidification, the metal takes the shape of the cavity. Casting can produce a variety of parts with complex shapes such as engine blocks, transmission housings, pistons and sculpture. Casted parts can be identified with their sandy finish and rounded edges. You can also see a parting line, which is the line between the top half and the bottom half of the mold. Aluminum, bronze, brass, steel, gold and many other metals can be casted. Aluminum is the first metal you want to experiment with because it has a low melting temperature. It's easier to melt and simpler to cast. Overall this project cost me $300, but I didn't have to pay for much safety equipment because I didn't use much. But looking back it wasn't the brightest idea. Obviously to melt aluminum you need a heat source. Some options are electricity, propane and charcoal. Electricity makes a clean job. Very small electric furnaces cost about $500. Propane is very popular among hobbyists. The main cost is the burner, which you'll pay $100 or $200 on eBay. I chose charcoal for simplicity and low cost. I started out with a 5 gallon paint can. It's both galvanized and painted. And this is not an ideal situation because when heated, the zinc coating in the paint produced toxic gases on the first run. I added, I added some mortar to add thermal inertia. 3 inches thick floor, 2 inches walls and 2 inches on the cover. The whole set weighs 50 pounds. Regular mortar can be used, although there are some specialized mortars called refractory mortars which are more durable in the heat. I put some pure flexible fiberglass all around the furnace. Above 540 Celsius it degrades over time, but it's affordable and effective. With some fire bricks, I made sure the fiberglass is not compressed, so that it has its maximum level in of insulation. To me, insulation was essential to reach the higher temperatures. There's a rule saying that above 200 Celsius, the main loss of heat from a surface becomes radiation, and the losses are exponential. At 700 Celsius, the losses are huge. You must provide a lot of heat just to maintain the temperature. Let the mortar dry for at least 24 hours. Then fire it slowly to harden the mortar. As you know, combustion requires air to occur. The amount of air available influences the intensity of the heat. So there is a pipe in the bottom where air is blown inside. I simply used a cheap hair blower and made a quick support. I added the grid in the bottom so that air is evenly distributed on the charcoal. After a couple of tests, the heat was sufficient to melt some aluminum. Depending on the amount of air blown inside, the furnace generates 5 to 10 kilowatts of heat and reaches 1000 Celsius. It's beautiful, isn't it? The crucible is the recipient which holds the liquid metal. When melting aluminum, steel crucible can be used because steel melts at twice the temperature aluminum does. But don't use any metal cans. Their thin wall rusts quickly and you'll end up with a leak. And if the leak meets water, water is vaporized, pressurized, and you get a couple of risky exploding aluminum bubbles. Your other option is a refractory crucible. A refractory material is one that remains intact and solid at high temperatures for a very long time. There are many refractory materials and recipes. To melt aluminum, a 50-50 mix of fire clay and sand is alright. That's what I did. But refractory crucibles can also be bought on eBay for $50 or $100. Looking back, it's a wise option. It takes time and effort to build refractory crucibles. And you have no warranty they won't break. Homemade crucibles need to be heated before being used. It transforms the clay into a ceramic by a series of cool chemical reactions. You basically have to ramp up slowly from room temperature to maturing temperature. And each type of clay has its firing schedule, 
but a typical ramp is 200 Celsius per hour. The simplest way to cure a crucible is the electric pottery oven. But I didn't find any pottery club in my town, so I used my furnace. With a charcoal furnace, it's hard to ramp up the temperature precisely. I used the temperature color chart as a guideline. The principle is that every warm object emits light whose color is, rela is, ref uh, is related to its temperature. For example, a full cherry red color tells us that the local temperature of the material is 815 Celsius. When heating a crucible, you must always let it cool down in the furnace. Rapid cool down with a cracked crucible. To verify if you have completed the maturation process, scratch it with your nail. A ceramic material with no cracks will resonate nicely. Here's an example. Building a good crucible is an art in itself. Mine had a short life. After 10 hours it was full of cracks and getting dangerous to use. The most common technique to make molds is using green sand. Green sand is not green. We only refer here to the humidity of the sand mix used. The mix is made of sand, clay powder and water. Green sand doesn't cost much and is reusable a thousand times. The finer the sand, the finer the details and the smoother the finish. So I sifted the sand with the finest sifter I could find. You'll be surprised to hear that cat litter is actually clay, bentonite clay. I turned it into powder with a coffee grinder who overheated a little. And you need a homogeneous mix so that clays around every grain of sand. An easy way to do this is to drop the mix on the floor and knead it with your feet. There's one easy way to test the efficiency of your green sand. Take some in your hand and make a pellet. Good green sand makes a good shape and retains details. It breaks nicely and doesn't stick too much in the hand. Ideal water and clay content varies with the sand and clay used. I tested about 10 different combinations and chose the best. Apart from green sand, you need two plywoods and two identical flasks. I built my flask with 1x4s. The upper flask is called the cope and the bottom one is called the drag. A pattern is used to create the shape of the cavity in the sand. The pattern can be the part itself or a wooden model. In my case, I built a model from a wood panel and tin wire. Avoid any negative angles. The sand gets trapped and it's impossible to remove the pattern without breaking the sand. You also need a wood model for the sprue and the runners. The sprue is the opening in the mold where you pour the liquid metal. The runners allow the liquid to circulate inside the cavities. Finally, powdered chalk is used for its hydrophobic properties. It repels water and thereby prevents green sand from sticking to the wooden parts. Molding steps. Drop the first plywood on the table. Place a first flask on it. Then center your pattern and runners. Sprinkle some chalk. Add green sand. Ram as much as you can. You can't compact too much. Scrape the top. Use the second plywood to flip over. Place the second flask on top of the first. Sprinkle some chalk. Position the sprue. Add the sand. Ram again. Scrape. Separate the two flasks. Remove the sprue, the pattern and the runners with precaution. Correct any sand default with the tip of your finger. Pierce the vents in the cope, which allow air to escape from the mold cavities as the, alum as the aluminum flows in. Close the flask back together with the cope on top. And you're ready to pour. Heat progressively the furnace with the crucible inside. This takes almost an hour. Pack loosely the crucible with small pieces of aluminum scrap. Continue to heat the furnace until the aluminum is melted. When it is, a layer of oxide always forms on top. Scrape it with a steel stem. Do it until the aluminum is clean. Make sure the aluminum is very hot, very liquid before pouring into the mold. It should be about 100 Celsius above melting temperature. To make sure the liquid can make its way into the mold pattern, 
before solidifying. You can see that a bubble has formed on top of the mold. That's because there were no vents. The air can escape from the mold cavity elsewhere than the sprue. On the following pour, I added the vents. And it made quite a difference. The aluminum just flowed in like orange juice in a black hole. The resulting parts were also better. I don't have any video though. Once the metal is poured, wait several minutes for the aluminum to solidify and cool down. The pouring step is very dangerous and proper safety equipment should be used. That includes flameproof pants and jackets, aluminum knee length coats and leggings, hard hats, molded shoes with metatarsal guards, aluminum or leather gloves, and specialized tongues. One could decide not to use any safety equipment like these guys in India who make the man holes of New York. But accidents are frequent and this is what happened to a guy who wore regular working shoes. Unmold the parts by breaking the sand. Use some tools because the aluminum is still hot. The sand close to the aluminum looks burned but put everything back in the bucket and mix it. And you can add the water if the sand gets dry over time. Cut out the parts, fill the burrs. In my case the remaining step was to stick the magnets. And this is how you build a custom aluminum fridge magnet. In the description below the video you'll find some very useful links if you're interested in the foundry hobby. Thank you for watching.